Is an LDS woman's reward in the celestial kingdom a life of polygamy forever? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you joining us. And we have all the way from Florida today, Lisa Brockman. Thanks, Lisa, for coming and sharing your Thank story. Thank you for having me. You're here in Salt Lake to do some other things, I yes. know, but it's sure nice to have you. Thank you. And I appreciate you coming. And uh, why don't you tell us where you were born and a little bit about your background? I was born in Honolulu, <laughs> Hawaii. Yeah. And... How long did you live there? Only eight months. Oh, My okay. dad was doing his residency in the Army. And oh. so we moved several places and then ended up in California between four and eight years old. And then when we were eight, we moved to Salt Lake. And my dad had grown up in Salt Lake City. Oh. And my mom was from Idaho. So. And they're active Mormons, are They're they? very devout, yeah. yes. And your whole family, I guess. How yes. many brothers and sisters? I have two brothers and two sisters. Oh, okay. Yep, I'm a sixth generation Mormon, <laughs> very active in the Mormon church growing up. Had a good strong testimony and absolutely baptized at age eight and all that stuff, I yeah. guess. And, mm -hmm. Okay. Did and uh, primary and then Sunday school, I guess. And, all of uh, it. Young, young women's, women's youth programs. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. And uh, you went to school here locally in Salt Lake. I did. I went to yeah. East High School. Okay. Yep. And then you. Uh, uh, took seminary, I guess. And, I did. You know. I did take seminary. Now, and, it, and I have to admit, uh, and this whole program is going to be a little different, uh, uh, this one, and we're actually going to do a second one with uh, Lisa, because you've written a book, and we want to go through that a little bit, but I, I know from the book that you ran into a couple of questions during seminary time. Yes. You want to share yes. those? Do you remember them? <laughs> well, the first one, when I grew up as a child, I mean, I just believe the church was true with all my heart from the time I can remember. Yeah. Never doubted that. And I didn't really think about the doctrines. I just thought everybody, everybody believed what we believed pretty much. Like I, I knew they didn't because I knew that Joseph Smith had, been, had claimed that God told him all the other sects are an abomination of the Lord when he sure. was seeking which church do I join. <laughs> so... I knew they didn't believe what we believed, but I don't know. I just never was very thoughtful about somebody else's view of God. I wasn't curious. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, when I got into seminary, it was my senior year. And my seminary teacher one day started teaching us that Heavenly Father physically impregnated Mary. <laughs> Have and I was horrified. I'd never heard that in my life. And I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> and I stopped him. And I'm like, in the, in the class, I stopped him. I was like, could you repeat that? <laughs> like, I, I can't believe what I'm hearing. And he said, well, yeah. And he started talking about it. I said, that's incest. <laughs> like he's married to heavenly mother and she's his daughter. And I had no category for it. And I was just horrified. And then my teacher said, well, there are just some ideas, some beliefs in the Mormon church that you just have to trust <laughs> and we don't talk about them that much. Yeah. And I was like totally derailed. And that was the first time I was really confronted with, it was horrifying to me. Well, I knew about that doctrine and yet I never put the words together that this is heavenly father having sex with his daughter mm. or one of his daughters isn't that strange that is yeah, yeah. i wonder how like, many lds even think of that concept right yeah. and i wonder why that got me because <laughs> yeah, so many doctrines didn't but that one definitely stirred me up yeah and then the other one is I, the one I started with today about polygamy. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was a senior in high school. I was really into boys. Like, boys were my god, I would say. <laughs> yeah. I, had, I had been bred <laughs> to worship boys, and I did that really well. <laughs> so anyway, but as I thought about, I was getting closer to the, you know, marrying age. Not that I was anywhere near that and right. prepared for that. But as I thought about that, I could not digest 
the idea that I would be a polygamous wife in the celestial kingdom if I were to get there someday. And there was nowhere else I wanted to be. I wanted eternal life. Yeah. And so you wanted the temple marriage and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so I always <laughs> wanted the temple marriage from the time I was five years old, probably. So anyway, one day I just randomly asked my mom after school, Mom, how do you deal with the reality that you're going to be a polygamous wife in heaven? And it was genuine. And I don't at all follow her for her response, but she just said, Lisa, I can't think about that. That's one of those things I just have to believe up there. It's going to be okay. And once, once we get there, we'll understand. We'll it understand. And we'll live it. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, uh, uh, mm, it's not working for me this time. <laughs> Usually I can do that Explain and do that away. intellectual disconnect yeah. or shut down. And I don't at all fault her. I just think that's what you have to do in the Mormon church to um, be present with some of these doctrines. <laughs> and it was shocking to hear those and to think about those. And oh. your mom's response was... I mean, I wasn't shocked by the poly polygamy in heaven because yeah. I always knew that that right. was the destiny. Right. Um, it was just... Very, it was just a very disturbing reality to me as I got older. Yeah. Now, was it during this time that you ended up at a Pentecostal church? Was that during oh, for seminary? a field trip? Was that no, seminary? That was, was that... when I was probably fourteen or fifteen years old. We had oh. a Sunday school teacher, and he was oh, an LDS uh, Sunday an school LDS school Sunday school oh. teacher, and he was just more, I think, just more open. To people of other belief systems yeah. not that he was adopting them but anyway so he had this man who worked for their the family company and he washed the windows and so oh. he told us about this man and invited or shared that we were going to do a field trip to their church yeah. and then he was going to come to our church and so oh. <laughs> we were um yeah, so we took a field trip, and well, I'm pretty sure I was that? a freshman of high school. What would you think of that? Well, we were in our Sunday best, like we were. And, and you were the only ones in your Sunday we best? We were the there. only ones in our Sunday best. Right. So we filtered into this, not a church house, like we were just in a commercial building of some sort, and yeah. it was a small congregation, maybe 50, 75 people. And most people were in jeans and T-shirts and tatted and... Um, <laughs> That was unusual. Living freely and long hair. This guy had really long hair. And then there was a band with an electric guitar and drums. And I, I had never been exposed to anything like that in yeah. my life. So we filter in and we sit on the back row. So there's all these 14, 15 year olds in our Sunday best. We were such fish out of water. <laughs> and that first song begins and they're cranking on the bands which now I completely appreciate um, <laughs> cranking on that electric guitar and I just was filled with so much judgment yeah I didn't have a category for this kind of worship and so it wasn't that it was just a different kind of worship it was unholy it was wrong and I sort of sat there I think quite piously sure judging in all, judgment all and words. then people started to lift their hands and I was like <laughs> what's happening like this is unholy it's wrong so that was a shocker I didn't know people did that in worship and now it's just changed hasn't it <laughs> yes yeah. well, I think what I love about being with the biblical Jesus and being apprenticed to the biblical Jesus and living and flowing in God's kingdom the biblical God is that there's so much freedom yeah. there's so much freedom the way you love God and the way you love others, and there's so much And we don't have freedom. to judge, do we? And no. Or, or we don't it doesn't have mean it's wrong. Same pride there's... or judgment that the, that we did. Right. Now, you were an active uh, tennis player. I guess you played at the University of Utah. I did. You did, and mm -hmm. uh, played piano. Yes. Some other talents you might have. I Anything played else? so you many dance? sports. Did you? Um, one of the gifts my parents gave me is just the ability to get involved in anything I wanted. Yeah. And my mom was really good at making that happen. So from yeah. the time I was probably five years old, I was in dance lessons. I started gymnastics. <laughs> I started swim team at seven, diving team, tennis team, soccer. So gymnastics team, competitively, I was competitive in everything. And so we were that kind of family. 
Back then, that was more unusual. Today, this is how families do life a lot in yeah, our culture, but we were pretty unique that way. So, But a close family, right? Family home evenings. And, family home evenings yeah. and highly valued family. What did you think of Jesus, if you can recall back as a teenager and met seminary and all that? Do you kind of I remember think that, that, I mean, I just, Jesus was my brother. Our older brother. Our older brother. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the most prominent <laughs> view I had of him or thought. Um, I didn't think a lot of Jesus. We talked a lot about, like, we're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I thought we're Christians because Jesus is in the name of our sure, church. Sure. Um, but Jesus, like, he suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he gave me the ability to overcome the grave. Mm. That's pretty much the essence, yeah. that I could resurrect and then exalt if I so chose. And then everything else was up to you. Yes. Kind of. So I would say more prominent than Jesus to me was the prophet. Much more prominent. Much more uh, of an impact on yes. our lives. That yes. was what the prophet said. And, so and who the prophet was. Yeah. I think I revered Spencer W. Kimball <laughs> far more than I revered Jesus. Really? Yeah. yeah. I just, we taught, I mean, we sang praise to the man <laughs> as a hymn. That's right. Right? Yeah. So Joseph <laughs> Smith was revered, and I really revered these guys. And I mean, if they'd told me to jump, I'd ask them how high. Like, there was just no question that these men were appointed and anointed yeah. from Heavenly Father. And so definitely more weight uh, was given to the prophets for me. Yeah, to the church. And mm -hmm. So after high school, then uh, what happens in life? Well, after high school, I was supposed to play tennis for BYU. Mm. And I was, though quite rebellious. My senior year of high school, the pressure cooker, I would call it, of shame and never feeling like I could be worthy enough, never feeling like I could make myself worthy enough for Heavenly Father's love and acceptance and for His blessings. I got so tired and it's like your cul our culture took on the accent of that works-based love and acceptance. And mm. it filtered into our family culture. It's everywhere. And I just... It is pretty... It's pervasive. Yeah, pervasive. oppressive, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And so um, something in me snapped. And I was like, just... I don't care. I can't do this. I don't want to do this anymore. I totally believe it with all my heart still. Not a question that it's true. But pragmatically right now, my friends who are drinking on Friday and Saturday nights, they're getting relief from this shame and this tension of worthiness and unworthiness. And I want that. And so mm -hmm. my senior year of high school, I began partying. And I just remember shutting down my conscience one drink at a time one cuss word at a time. And I can very vividly remember when I shut down my conscience. And so... You said <clears throat> in, somewhere uh, in the book, but you compartmentalize God into silence. I thought that was an interesting mm. phrase because mm. I think we Mormons do that uh, whenever they're not doing uh, what's right and they know mm. they're sinning and shaming. They just compartmentalize God and put him silence him and yeah is that what you felt like well you yeah and there was so much disapproval yeah. like I knew the way <laughs> God was seeing me was not lovely was mm. not acceptable he was disapproving but I knew also that if I wanted to come back into his acceptance and be worth I had to make myself worthy and I needed to go see my bishop and I wasn't ready to try and be perfect again. Right. <laughs> and so I was like, forget it. And so I, with the same passion, I lived every other area of my life, tennis, academics, friendships. I went into the party world. Well, because I was in that whole culture at the time, I didn't really want to go submit to, myself to BYU, to BYU standards. Right. And so at the last minute, pretty much redirected to the University of Utah, mm -hmm. like the summer before my freshman year of college. Uh -oh. And so when I got to the U, one of my tennis friends on the tennis team said that there's this guy named Gary 
and you guys are going to click like you're two peas in a pod. And so now she lined me up. Player, he's right? a baseball yeah. player. Okay. So Liz lined me, lined me up with Gary and we totally clicked. Yeah. Uh, Gary uh, provides an interesting question to you eventually. I don't know. Yes. Is there a story between this and and the question he asks you? Yes. Well, Gary and I went out a couple times, and on our first couple dates, we'd established that I was LDS, and he was what he called a born-again Christian, and I'd never heard of one of those before. <laughs> this is back in the 80s in Utah. Never there met a born-again no There was no internet, <laughs> never met a born-again Christian. I had a friend who was Lutheran, but she never went to church. I had a friend who was Baptist, and he went to church. Uh, but other than that... It was just pretty much Mormon or non-Mormon. Right. And so, yeah, he said he was a born-again Christian. I was like, what What's that? is that? <laughs> and, um, I mean, we talked about it briefly, and I was like, I don't really want to talk about this. Like, let's just party. Let's have fun. You're really cute. <laughs> I can really worship you. Yeah. So, anyway, um, we dated about a month. And then we were driving around campus at the University of Utah picking up report cards because there was no internet. And I put my hand on the car door handle to open up the car and get, uh, to open up the door to go into the communications building. And I'll never forget, snow was just falling all around us. It was such an emotional moment for me. I remember every detail. And he, I went to open the door and Gary said, Lisa, how do you know the church is true? <laughs> and nobody had asked me that my entire life. And I whipped my head around to him. And it's like his words were floating through space. It was slow motion for me. And I said, because I've had a burning in the bosom, and I know it's true. And he said, how could you entrust your entire eternal destiny to an, a burning in the bosom? And I, I was like, I have no other standard for knowing truth. Like, how could you not? Yeah. This is the only <laughs> is way, the way to know. We, this is the way it had never occurred truth. to me. And he said, and then Gary proceeded to ask me, how do you know Joseph Smith is a true prophet of God? How can you defend the authenticity of Joseph Smith as a prophet of God? Can you defend the historicity of the Book of Mormon? And I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know what Isides are. I don't know what Osides are. I have never thought about this in my life. And as he proceeded to ask me really legitimate questions, one after the next, like that solid foundation of all those little works, paying a full tithe at one point for a lot of my life, obeying the word of wisdom, going to church every Sunday, all those works that I'd just thrown as stones into the foundation of my eternal life, destiny turned to quicksand. And I just felt like I'm in a free fall. I cannot defend what I believe. I don't, I know what I've heard every Sunday. I can articulate the plan of salvation backwards and forwards, but a burning in the bosom <laughs> is not going to satisfy this man. And isn't it interesting as you're saying this, that you've been through all these years of sacrament meetings and Sunday school, seminary, uh, and all the, and all of a sudden you're, gosh, I've yeah. never thought about that stuff before. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not even a paradigm for that. Wow. So did you, you started studying or trying well, to find out? Well, we avoided it? it over Christmas break. He went back to Idaho for Christmas and he came back and we, if I wasn't so infatuated with Gary, I would have been out of there by our next encounter because <laughs> Gary came back and he's like, we need to start dealing with this issue because we were very much infatuated with each other and enjoying spending time together. And yeah. so he said, let's study the Bible. Well, we both decided let's study the Bible because we have that doctrine in common. Right. Now, and, and you were hopeful that he would, once he learned the truth, that he yes. would become LDS. Oh, right? totally. I set out to convert Gary to Mormonism <laughs> and he hoped I would encounter a Jesus he believed I never knew. Yeah. So we began Bible study. <laughs> and how'd that go? Oh my gosh, the first study <laughs> talked about the nature of the biblical God. One God manifested in three persons, eternal to eternal, not a man who progressed into Godhood, not flesh and bones, but spirit. I just felt like my whole world came undone. I was like, this isn't true. And he'd say, well, God is spirit. No, he's flesh and bones. How can you defend that? John 4, 24, God is spirit. I'm like, it doesn't say that. Look at the Joseph Smith translation. And I'm like, 
wow, the Joseph Smith translation has changed that meaning of that verse. Mm -hmm. And it's like I would fight grammar. Nowhere else in my life, if it says God is spirit, would I fight grammar? Fight but I fought grammar. And I just remember anger, rage, really, like very passionately opposed to this biblical vision of God. And it was so incomprehensible to me, this Trinitarian God. He used that word. I'm like, what the heck is a trinity? <laughs> and um, incomprehensible. And there was something about the Mormon God because he was like me. Yeah, he was it's a, not he in, was a man. He wasn't man incomprehensible. Yeah. I had grown up in a faith that brought God down to my size and then elevated me one day into Godhood. Yeah. And so I didn't transcendence was incomprehensible and not a good thing. Yeah. So that's where it began. And I just remember being absolutely, um, I was just so angry. Really? I was angry. I'm that, like, that you didn't know or that there uh, was other thing, other perspectives? I was that... angry that he was making these claims and showing me in the Bible. I think I was so terrified. Yeah. that there was such a difference. I just assumed that the church was, that the, church was the biblical, yeah. was presenting me biblical information. Right. And so I wasn't yet angry at the church. I, I was defending the church Tr tooth and nail. Right. And so I was, I was angry by what he was saying, even though he was showing me in the Bible. I was still, I was just angry. Um, did, did grace come up at all? Oh grace? my gosh. Well, that was probably, so I would have been out of there after that study if he didn't look like a god. Um, <laughs> really, I would have. That was just too much. So the next, every Sunday we would have Bible study and we would party Friday and Saturday and have Bible study on Sunday. And um, yeah, so the next study, I think we talked about the nature of man according, men and women according to the Bible. And he introduced the idea that according to the Bible, human nature is sinful, not divine. And it's almost like a demon came out of me. And I just screamed out and I said, I do not have a sinful nature. <laughs> and the irony is that there was nothing in my life that could support that, you that comment. <laughs> I mean, I was as dark as dark could be. Like I was living deep, neck deep in sin, but I was I mean, I, there was a demand of me that, and an anger that you were, that he was calling me sinful. And I know from the book that you commented on the young women's motto, talking mm -hmm. about that I'm a divine, uh, we have a divine nature. I but cannot we, recite okay. the young women's but motto we, today. But you have a, a divine nature. Yes. And they talked about that, I think, at this most recent general conference, again, about the divine nature of yeah. So we don't we don't really consider ourselves sinful. No. Uh, I, mean, I didn't perfect, even have a category for that. Yeah. And it made me very angry. It just yeah. felt so diminishing. Yeah. So you go on with uh, with Gary for a while? Or? Well, for five months, Gary and I did Bible study. Mm. And every Sunday was kind of that intensity. Yeah. And it was me just fighting and fighting and working at convincing him that Mormon doctrine was true. But what I came to see was there was this chasm about who, the nature of God, the nature of people, how we get to God, how we restore relationship, that the Bible's all about this relational community of the Trinity inviting us into that community. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father's plan was that I would progress into Godhood, everything, that was important seemed like a polar opposite. And I didn't know how to reconcile that, but I fought tooth and nail to defend Mormonism for five months. And at the same time, I started reading books like Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell mm. and books that were a defense for the Bible and where some of these authors like Josh began as atheists yeah. and they were gonna disprove the Bible and so that was helpful for me to really wrestle through, is this the word of God? Because it's presenting a different plan of salvation nice. and a different God. Yeah. And I need to know how to reconcile this. Is the Book of Mormon the word of God? Is the Bible the word Did of God? Did you share this with the bishop or with your family at oh, this no. point? No. 
And I think it's kind of hard to bring those things up, isn't it? Oh, family? really hard. And yeah. I had, um, I think that's one of the really sad parts of my story is that I didn't feel the freedom to um, involve all other of our, people all because of our stories are that way. Yeah, it? you couldn't involve. No, and I think, I think that's probably sad for my parents because they were very much whiplashed when I came to the place <laughs> that I came to. But it just wasn't possible. Yeah. Well, and they they really don't want to hear things. I mean, you know how you were with Gary at the beginning. Right. You're very defensive and, no, this is true. And yes. don't make me think about things that are uncomfortable. Yes. And, and it just happens. I don't know. And then once we come and our eyes are opened, then you want to share. But they're not at the same level that we are right. in, in that journey. And so it becomes... Right. You know, they become resistant and on the defensive. And... Yes. Well, gosh. Um, so what happens after? Well, after next? about five <laughs> months, I came to a place reading all these books about the Bible and biblical manuscripts and the history and all of that. And then looking for historical evidence to prove the Book of Mormon to be true. Yeah. Reading about the authenticity of Joseph Smith as a prophet researching and researching and I researched like crazy and it wasn't just anti-Mormon literature like yeah. I was reading Bruce R. McConkie I was reading our prophets I was reading Joseph Smith's discourses yeah. it's not like I was just give me all the anti-Mormon stuff I just needed to understand yeah. so I could articulate and so after five months I came to the place where I saw there isn't historical evidence to support the Book of Mormon. And there's tremendous, more than any other book in history, the Bible has more evidence to support it. So once I got to that place, it helped me begin to wrestle with individual doctrines. And so it's like peeling an onion where little bits of light would get in. And I remember the reality that my nature is sinful it's like suddenly that sunk into me it began to wash over me and i began to see i'm not basically good i need a savior i think that's the message isn't it that we actually need a savior not just to resurrect us from the grave right but for eternal life like i there is nothing i can do to make myself worthy of god's love but he's given me Jesus and all I have to do is accept his gift so that was the first doctrine that started to get into me and this was during your study time and when you were yeah and were you uh, with Gary then and I was, was he seeing this we were still dating understanding yes he must have been thrilled to have you I think Start he was, learning. because when I share this reality of the gospel with people, I'm thrilled when the light starts to get in. <laughs> so over the next four months, these major doctrines began to sink into me, and I began to agree with them. The need of a savior and the gift of... That I'm sinful, not divine. Yeah. yeah. And I started, I knew the biblical God is... One God manifests in three persons. But back then in the 80s in Utah, people described the Trinity as an egg. <laughs> yeah. So that's not even accurate. <laughs> like it's heretical. But, you know, God's like a white, a yolk and a shell. shell. And I'm like, yeah. what? So people weren't explaining it well to me. So I was wrestling with that. And um, Gary left for the summer. And then I kept reading and I kept studying and it was august right before my sophomore year of college someone gave me a book called beyond mormonism and it was uh, written by jim spencer who was a man who'd converted to mormonism and he was a professor at rick's college at the time and i journeyed with him through his story and one day my under my mattress were all sorts of books um i had the journal of discourses i had mormon doctrine by mcconkey to this book huh? so it was my search because i was still living at home we lived mm -hmm. like blocks from the university so this day i read this book cover to cover and when i got to the end of the book i knew this god is a real god this god is a true god he's a good god and he's a god of love and i want to be in relationship with this god, this god. but i still can't get wrap my mind around this trinity 
And then it's like God just came and pulled back. It's like gave me a portal into another reality. And I had a vision of Jesus on the throne surrounded (laughs) by a sea of people bowing down. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come over and over. And I just fell to my face. I was like, yeah, I can't wrap my mind around you. I think that's the point. You're holy. I am not. And I want to be in this kingdom. And he's always been God. And uh, Yeah. And so I placed my trust in Jesus that day, the biblical Jesus for eternal life. Wow. Well, I hate to say it, but we'll have to continue this in the next episode. Okay. Okay. And and we're going to be introduced to uh, Lisa's book, Out of Zion, Meeting Jesus in the Shadow of the Mormon Temple. So we'll see you next time on the Ex-Mormon Files.